Thank you so much for being here. I know it's the end of the day. It's really, really good to be back at the Texas Cannabis Policy Conference. It's I'm so delighted to see familiar faces and also new faces here. Um, even though Heather Fazio is not in the room, do you guys mind giving her a round of applause? She's done just such a great job and everything. Thank you. Um, so this panel is very business and entrepreneur focused. Um, we have two leading entrepreneurs here who have survived and thrived in the cannabis industry, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur myself, and this particular industry is especially difficult. So the fact that these two gentlemen are here um, sharing their information is going to be very beneficial for anybody in the audience, whether you're a seasoned operator or you're a newbie starting out and you want to learn more. Um, and hopefully I have the right questions to ask. I want to elicit the responses from them so you guys can all learn. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Inkemo Keke. I am a serial entrepreneur. I started my uh, journey uh, right out of law school. I went to a large corporation, large law firm, and I practiced corporate transactional law. And then I segued into a senior business manager role at Fannie Mae. Uh, it's a large corporation, and I was in the law and policy division. And uh, I was responsible for creating a corporate strategy that matched what we were doing on Capitol Hill. So I had to intersect with corporate executives and lobbyists and lawmakers and politicians. So needless to say, I got a lot of um, professional experience. After that, I did take some time off to have two small children. And um, because I'm very much business obsessed, uh, building businesses, looking at um, either small or large, trying to figure out what I look at it as a puzzle. Is this going to survive? This, this company needs to pivot and do this. This is just what's in my mind. It's kind of scary. <laughs> so, um, so I'm very happy to to moderate this business panel um, and to uh, have these two gentlemen here. So when I started my uh, journey as an entrepreneur, I started my first company. It was a medical aesthetic laser clinic. My sister's a physician. Um, we started it in 2012 and it's still uh, in business to this day. It's been 12 years and I exited uh, out of that. I sold my 50% and I started the next company. It's a hemp and wellness company. And we sold that to an MSO, multi-state operator. And this was when CBD was just starting out. So we were pretty new in the industry and we um, knew the time was to pivot and get out. So we did uh, make that exit. And so now I have two existing companies. One, it's been around for a while. It's a Dendox. Um, we're a development company where we create research and innovation opportunities for a multinational company. And then the other one is Unawise, which Dr. Z just talked about if you were here in the last session. It's a patented a visual taxonomy system that identifies and scores cannabis products based on active ingredients. So if you have any specific questions about that, you can talk to Z in the audience. So having said that, let's get to our panel. So I'm going to introduce um, Tony. And then after, if you can just say a few words, and then I'll introduce Hans. And I'm reading because I want you guys to understand the accolades they have. They're very successful. And after um, we after this presentation, please feel free to talk to them. So Tony Gallo is managing partner of Sapphire Risk Advisory Group. He's considered, and I can definitely attest to this, the OG of the cannabis security. Tony has been in the cannabis industry since 2013, has worked with over 800 cannabis clients in over 35 states, designing their security program from application to operations. Tony is considered one of the leading security authorities in the state slash city application licenses process. So if you are involved in any sort of license application in any state, I know you've heard of Tony. Um, he has physical security build-outs and standard security operating procedures. Tony was recognized by High Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential Cannabis People and the MJs at the Cannabis Consultant Firm of the Year. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. I want to say a couple of remarks. I have to give her $20 for that, by the way. Just to, um, <laughs> here's an interesting thing. Been in the cannabis industry 11 years, based in Dallas, Texas. Now, who would think that the... A company that's been in 37 states working with 800 cannabis clients. Last week, we just opened our 160th cannabis location, helping our client, um, is based in Dallas, you know, of all the states to be in. Uh, very excited uh, to be here today in, in my adopted home state. Been here 25 years. Grew up in New York, New Jersey. I know you can tell that I have a Texas accent, but, you know, uh, but we're very excited being here and very excited 
to be sitting next to Hans, who's one of our clients, and uh, love working with him over the years on on many of his projects too. So I'm uh, I'm happy to be here. And uh, it, later on, if anyone has any questions, I did put a a, a photo, a, a picture of a drawings. If you want to take a photo of that for a dispensary to grow, you flip it over. By all means, you're welcome to take photos. Thank you, Tony. And I did mention that we were going to focus originally on this panel was R and D, research and development. Uh, retail and security. Akeem sends his regards. He was not able to make it because he was originally on the panel. Um, so we're going to focus on retail and security. Um, so Hans Henriquez, he's the CEO of Dazed Inc., the parent company of Lazy Days and Coffee Shops. He comes with 20, 20 years of experience in the cannabis industry, specifically retailing, distribution, franchising, licensing, payment processing, brand building, and business development. He's also CEO of Medex Holdings, which is currently traded on the OTC markets with a mission to support the Lazy Days, coffee shops, brands, and franchises. Thank you, Oz. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, thank you for the invitation and, and uh, very happy to be here to, to present in front of you guys today. My name is Hans Enriquez, uh, CEO of Medex Holdings. Like she said, we are a publicly traded company. Uh, we are the parent company of Days Dink and the Lazy Days Coffee Shop. If you hadn't had a chance to have some Lazy Days Coffee, uh, right outside. But uh, the Lazy Days Coffee Shop is celebrating its 20th year uh, this December. I started this company. I'm the founder of Lazy Days in 2004, right after I graduated from Texas State. Go Bobcats. And... Um, and I've been doing it ever since, but I've, uh, ex you know, had experience in cannabis. Um, I mean, we started through retail, actually, we, we entered the, the space uh, through smoke shops and uh, we create, we wanted just to create a, a, a you know, a better mousetrap really, um, you know, for when cannabis uh, did get legalized. And, and we've been waiting for that for 20 plus years. But the Lazy Days concept has evolved from a smoke shop to the the concept that you see now is which is modeled after Amsterdam style coffee shops. Uh, they've been doing the consumption lounges in Amsterdam for quite some time, and and we'd like to introduce that um, and uh, position ourselves as cannabis goes legal. So yeah, and uh, thanks. I'm just happy to be here and answer your all's questions. And uh, my team's outside. We're also offering a lot of uh, opportunities in the space. So uh, you could talk to myself or any one of my team members after after the after the presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Hans. And so let me just start with some questions. I'm going to start with Tony. And this is really about experience and expertise because he's been in this industry for so long. And um, so what are the unique security challenges faced by cannabis businesses and how does Sapphire Risk Advisory address these challenges? I think one of the main focuses, you know, there's six different business lines in the cannabis industry, dispensaries, cultivation, grow, manufacturing, delivery, so forth and so on. One of the biggest challenges that I see when it comes to the security is to think of uh, from a retail point of view, the dispensary or the, the adult use, is to actually think of the security as part of, the, of your program that's going to make you profitable. What can you do with your security program that in turn is going to prevent you from having a, a deficiency in your margins, which is a loss? a break-in, a robbery, um, an employee st uh, that's stealing. And we do a lot of risk assessments where we'll go to Colorado, Oregon, Washington, California. Why did I pick those four states? They were one of the first emerging states. And because of their deficiencies when it came to their security program, a lot of them have either gone out of business because of that or are not making the money that they, they do. So Kind of focus on when you're designing your security going forward is you got to use it. You can't just design it because you want the state of Texas to check that box. And I mean, what are some unique um, security solutions you've implemented for your cannabis clients specifically? How have you saved them? Sure. So, save the money specifically. So let's look at the main equipment, video alarms, access control, uh, uh, the video system, you know, uh, uh, you don't need a hundred cameras at your location. A lot of times we don't install any equipment. So we, we don't have any skin in the game when it comes to the installing, but a lot of times we'll get involved when an integrator will come to you, someone who's going to install that. And they say to you, um, um, you know, you need a hundred cameras or you need 30 access control. Each device and access control, which is the one you take the card. Almost everyone here has something called a proximity card something that allows you to get in and out of something uh, for the most part. 
those are $3,000 a unit installed. So if you can come back and you can design something to reduce that amount of flow, the floor plan design is very important. You know, if it's a grow facility, how does that flow plan work? Uh, what access does people have? So there's a lot of, of, of coming into prior to you actually building out a facility that can save you a lot from the security point. Okay. Um, and so Hans, your uh, business model and strategy, um, it's, it's, it's a little unique and, uh, and you're successful. You're still around, which is, you know, a lot of people are not. So um, hats off to you on that. Can you describe specifically your business model and how it integrates cannabis products into its offerings? Um, at its simplest, it is a hybrid model. It is a hybrid model of a restaurant and a retail model. And so what is that? That's a coffee shop and a dispensary. Put them together. That's the model. Um, and, uh, I mean, what differentiates a little bit, I mean, from your normal dispensary is that, I mean, you can pretty much buy weed anywhere, right? But you, you are not legally allowed to consume it anywhere. So that's one of the biggest differentiators, right? So our, our, our model is, is modeled after something that's been successful in, in Europe for quite some time. And um, so what we're trying to do is just cr to create an experience wrapped around it, something that's very unique, right? Something that's new um, that, that we can use that platform, that model to reintroduce cannabis to a whole new generation, right? To, and, and, and I, I've said this once before, and I thought, I thought it was kind of cool. You know, as, as we move into legalization, there's going to be a generation, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, that will have never known weed to be illegal. But they will always know a Lazy Days coffee shop was there and they could just go to the coffee shop and get a cup of coffee and a joint. That's where we want to see ourselves. Um, you know, it's, it's very... It's about positioning ourselves for when legalization takes place, which it's already taking place. So right now we're perfecting that model and, and we're not we're not reinventing the wheel here. I mean, we it, it's a coffee shop, but we have added a uh you know a moving target. We've added a, a, another layer to it, right? Which is a which is a, a an industry that's highly regulated. So how do you you know, you just you're mixing coffee with a highly regulated product, and and but at its simplest, it's it's a hybrid model. It's a restaurant and retail, and uh, we've put together a really nice experience, and and it's it's really about being simple: good weed, good people, good coffee. Um, you mentioned regulatory environment, so regulatory compliance is huge uh, in this space, uh, Tony. Especially for you, your business. How do you, how does Sapphire Risk ensure that its security solutions comply with all the local state? And federal regulations. Well, it's not. It's not really even the state and federal. It's even the city regulations mm -hmm. that come into play. It's, it, it, it's amazing how uh, much of regulations there are in this industry compared to almost any other industry. I've been in the in the retail uh, security field for over twenty five years. I worked for Macy's. I worked for Sears. I worked for uh, 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 Easy Pawn, which was a pawn shop chain in Texas. And even those requirements uh, uh, don't even uh, c compare to what you see in the states. And it's important that you make sure that you you follow those regulatory process. We have a team that actually reviews each state is different. Texas is different than Louisiana and so forth and so on. So it's very important that you get in front of that because when you get to a point where you finally – and, you know, who's, who's, is there anyone not from Texas? Let's do it that way. So everyone, okay. So one in, the, what state are you in? Okay. So everyone here is from Texas. So one day in our lifetime, the state of Texas is going to allow you to go to a store and buy cannabis right now. And, and like any other person, like an adult use. So in that time, but when that time occurs, there's going to be regulations. Uh, from my point of view, it would be how long you retain the video of the camera system. How do you restrict someone from getting access to uh, the secured storage room, which is your vault area in the back room? How do you account for uh, cash? What do you do if there's a robbery or stuff for it and so on? But you need to understand those regs. And from a business point of view, if you don't, you don't get a license. You may it, They may not deny you, but they may say, I'll be back in a month. In that month, you're paying rent. 
and that month you're paying people, and that month you may even already have product that's on its way, and that month you could never open again probably in a good chance. So that's where the importance of that comes into play. Can you give it a good example of a regulatory pitfall where you've seen a client just really mess themselves up because they didn't follow some regulation and it really impacted their business? Yeah, so uh, uh, we'll take video, you know, cameras where they need to be placed. Most times, uh, every state uh, that we've been in that requires cameras to watch the transaction and how it occurs. Uh, also, the, the retention of the video. Um, some states require 30 days, some require 60, some require a year. If you don't have those uh, those in, and which is important, you don't understand that, you're not going to get the approval. And again, you'll have to go back and, 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 and work on that. The secured storage room at night, where do you secure the product? What kind of environment it is, depending on the state? Is it, is it a metal? Is it in a vault? Is it in a safe? Is it in a hard construction? And again, the state will come in and they'll test that or they'll look at that before you get the, the uh, approval to, to move forward. And Hans, what about you, regulatory? You've you've had to pivot, but it's not as much on your radar as uh, licensed uh, operators. So how how are you navigating all the regulations? Well, we um, we do operate in New Mexico, right? So we do operate in an adult use state, and and we did have I believe Tony worked on on that one as well. Um, it's like you mentioned the audio video. Um, our our DVR systems are behind two steel doors in a vault regular uh, regulators came in and said you know uh that's all good and all but your camera system still needs behind be behind another cage right so it's just one additional one additional step there uh, i mean uh i operate on both sides of the line adult use and hemp um you know we're trying to use uh best standard practices from a, an adult use state and bring that over here to Texas, right? So we're kind of like overly compliant. Um, we've had the regulators in New Mexico stop by, look at our product, look at our inventory, look at our our uh, our security systems. We've had here in Texas, I've had every compliance officer show up within a week. Uh, Department of Agriculture, I've had DHS, I've had the state comptroller all within one week. Um, and what happened is I know the rules now, even though I thought I knew the rules, I know them even more. And then what they came in to look for were, uh, you know, what you would think uh, they, of course, they want everything to have COAs, but things that they were more concerned about were, you know, ingredient lists, uh, you know, did it have red dye in it or, or did that CO, did that QR code actually link back to the true, you know, to the, to the, tr to updated, you know, uh, COAs. So, um, now, when it comes to compliance or just regular, I mean, uh, it's across the board. So I'm using adult use state as kind of an example of what we should be doing here in Texas. Um, in in New Mexico, you're required to have your POS system connected to a state tracking system, which would be BioTrack. Here in Texas, that's not required, but you still need to make sure that you're doing inventory correctly, right? So, um, you know, even uh, having the comptroller looking at your inventory and saying, hey, well, you don't have an e-cig license, right? And you would think that, well, we don't sell any tobacco products any longer. Everything is hemp related. Why would I need a tobacco license? But I don't know if you know that anything can, anything with a battery or battery powered or a vaporizer product is considered e-cig and that that requires an additional license. So um, yeah, we, we, we definitely experienced compliance uh, across the board and, and, you know, I, I experienced it as the most difficult I could ever all in one week. And we got through it and it wasn't easy, but yeah, we, we deal with it. Just for background. So what, what are you dealing with? You're in New Mexico. Could you describe a little bit more about how many stores you have volume and employees and so forth? Mm -hmm. So we, we currently have three stores operating. We are a franchise model. So we can, we offer this for entrepreneurs who are interested in entering the market. Right. And so um, we've got one store operating in New Mexico, Albuquerque. We've got two in Austin. We've got another one opening in San Antonio. And then we have a developer agreement out in the East Coast. And there should be developing at least a minimum of three units out there. Um, and each state is different. Maryland has its own set of regulations, right? And it's completely different from New Mexico. So you, you really do need to also do your homework and understand state to state regulations. 
what's allowed. I mean, I, if I, if I recall, New Jersey does have a consumption lounge, uh, law or, you know, regulation, but there's no food allowed on premise, right? So you have to find a way, each state is going to give you a different set of rules. You as the entrepreneur need to be able to create a business model that works around those rules and that can be successful. Um, some are easy, some are not, you know, so it depends which market you want to go in. We went into the New Mexico market based on that. There was the lowest barrier of entry, you know, and it was a new market. Um, we're not going to go to California. Cost of doing business is, is crazy. And, and Colorado is, is, you know, is a mature market, but you know, prices aren't, aren't there yet. You would think that Colorado would be the Mecca of lounges. They've got like one and a half lounges and, and, and it's only allowed in Denver. You know, so, um, you know, you, 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 you have to understand your state's regs and, and uh, then just uh, adapt. Thank you. And so, you know, one of my favorite topic, topics is technology and innovation. Um, and, you know, we've been working hard on Unwise um, and trying to get ahead of kind of where the market's going. I would be interested to know, Tony, what cutting edge technologies or innovation solutions do you use in your business or do you or do you want to or planning to? Well, I think one of the things we, we're, we're doing now is we're doing transaction verification, which is something that retail does, but a lot of the cannabis industry didn't use that technology until recently. And that is we're able to match the cameras to the transaction. So if you want to pull up that sale to see, you know, did they know somebody or did a discount? It's much easier to pull that up. So you're able to do that verification. We also use a lot of uh, AI technology. We're moving more into that when it comes to cameras, heat sensors, identifying uh, uh, issues outside uh, of, of the location. So as the technology of uh, videos and uh, systems and all improve, uh, we're spending more and more time upgrading a lot of that and, and the interface into that. Could you talk a little bit more about the AI technology, exactly what you're doing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, looking at AI now, it gives us the ability to utilize the camera system pretty much to identify anything that's going on. So if somebody is entering the building, uh, the AI will identify that individual, uh, or if there's a break-in at night, the AI, AI technology will be able to determine uh, what was that break in, you know, uh, uh, definitely identify a difference between a dog and a human being or something of that nature. Uh, and so we, you know, we see that, that, that occurring a lot. Um, also, uh, we have the ability now, even with, like I said, with heat sensors, we got this actually from car dealerships where you can actually identify where most of your customers are going in your sales floor throughout the day. Uh, and that's maybe where you put your best product or your most highly desirable product to sell. Uh, and it's giving the, it's giving, uh, the retailers a little bit of a step up. When it comes to cultivation, we also have AI technology that can tell us if the humidity is too high in the grow facility. Obviously, we all know that that's a negative. Or if the heat's too high or too low, if the plant needs water, if there's any uh, uh, viruses, bugs or anything like that. And they'll tell you what kind of bug there is on that plant. So uh, pretty pretty interesting how uh, some of this technology has been growing. Yeah, and it's interesting because your um, your services really impact the consumer experience. Uh, you know, it really does because it all comes back to the consumer. Um, and for uh, Hans, you know, what is your, how do you really engage and have make sure that your consumers are having a very positive experience in your stores? With the security and everything that you're trying to do, how do you how how are you standing out and making sure that when the c customer comes in there, they're like, "I really like this. I'm coming back." And what are they remembering about the experience with Lazy Days? Well, um, I love retail science, and mm -hmm. I think your experience, and I think in any general situation, starts from the time you get out of the car. You, by the time you get out of the car, you're walking towards, you know, your your the establishment, what it looks like on the outside. Is the sidewalk clean? Are the windows clean? Um, are the lights on? Are there missing bulbs? Is it dusty? Did you get greeted as soon as you walked in? Did they look you in the eye and recognize you and acknowledge you as a customer happily and say, hey, welcome to the lazy days? That's the first and foremost thing. <clears throat> then good weed, good coffee, good people. Keep it simple, right? I mean, that's you can be about 
you can try and be a hundred things and you're going to be really shitty at a lot of them. So just try to be good at three things. So I've dumbed it down, just three things, right? Um, then is the place well lit? Is it, is it stay friendly? Are the color, is the color scheme warm? Are the seats comfortable? Are the tables clean? Are the ashtrays wiped down? Did they say bye to you when you left? What was the after, uh, how, what was the after journey, you know, when they left? Did you, what were the touch points? Did you email them? Did you get your data? Did you tell them happy birthday? Did you give them a discount? Did you welcome them back? Did you invite them to your loyalty program? Every single one of these things. And these are just like the tip of the iceberg on what it is to have a good experience. Was the weed good? Was it dry? Did you know, did like all of this matters, right? So um, I think experience is going to be the big differentiator from in, in, in any retail setting, right? I, I mean, if I, I can go to the fanciest dispensary that looks like it cost a million dollars, but the bud tender didn't know what the hell they were talking about, I would much rather go to a nice, well-lit store where they're well-trained, they have good weed, the bud tender knows what they're talking about, and and they're very relatable, right? And I, I don't want to go to a place that's overly snobby. So I, I think the experience is 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 a, a game changer. Um, you go to a shitty dispensary, you're never going to go back. If you didn't have a good experience there, why why would you ever go back? Um, and I think our customers, if you know, are if uh, if you have a chance, you go to our Google listing for New Mexico. So it's Lazy Days New Mexico, and take a look at those those reviews. Um, our customers are experiencing something they've never experienced before, ever. They're walking into a place and saying, wow, I cannot believe I can sit down, have a great cup of coffee, open up my laptop, smoke a joint, and just chill. I can have a business meeting. I can write a script. I can work on a movie. I can do something creative. I can do my schoolwork. I can just tune out. That's an experience that just people have have not been able to experience here in, in America. Right. So if you look at those reviews, people are just like, there's, there's, wow, I can't believe it. Best place ever. This must be heaven. We live in the future. It's really cool. So yeah, experience, it's all about experience. Um, you, uh, you can have a thousand dispensaries and, and those bud tenders that work at those dispensaries don't even have a place to consume on site. So it's also built by consumers or consumers, uh, you know, by people who are in the culture and want to be able to give that same experience for, you know, for the, for our peers. And, and, uh, you know, I think our, our, our sweet spot is people between 25 and 35 and, and, uh, they're the ones with disposable income. And I think they're really appreciating being able to have that experience as we usher in legalization. So that's, that's kind of the plan there, but it's, it's all about experience. Long story short. Uh, you mentioned customer feedback, and I would I wonder if you could share um, one of the best reviews you've received and also one of the worst ones where you're like, oh, my God, I really need to get <laughs> together. What <laughs> happened here? And, do, also, do both. and also, when you're listing all the things that are important, I was wondering, you did mention parking, and I have run a retail store before, and it's extremely important to have parking in Texas. I did know how important it is to have a parking spot where you can kind of discreetly go in these stores versus... I mean, do people really care to park their car right in front or do people want to go kind of go in low key? And all right. So, all right. So, well, okay. If, uh, worst, worst review. Uh, can't believe you're not open yet. And they got a one star review. <laughs> Y'all are taking too long to open. Right? I think that was, and, and we weren't even open yet. So I think um, I got a one star review during COVID because I was, working and I walked in with a bunch of boxes and I didn't have my mask on. They're like this, the goal of these people. Right. So um, those are my probably worst reviews. Best reviews are going to be the ones that I, that we read in New Mexico where lit, like someone describes it as heaven. Like, you know, you're like, wow, that's really weird. But like, it's just something that like they're blown away. They're walking into a place that they just never experienced this before. And they really enjoy it. And they say that the coffee's good and the weed is good and they love coming back. And then they become our best customers. So that, that, is you know that's awesome now as far as like parking i don't uh i i'm trying to get past that the area of discreteness i'm trying to normalize it i would like yourself tony 
everyone in here to walk into a, a Lazy Days coffee shop without thinking they're going to walk into some dark and dingy, you know, dispensary with, you know, shady character and, and it just, no, it's not that. I mean, you, you are, we are very coffee shop forward. I want you to feel as normal as going, sitting down at a coffee shop. So you shouldn't, no, not really. I'm not worried about the discreet. And yes, part you need parking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because we've also had downtown stores with very little parking and you're depending on walking traffic and, and that doesn't help. Okay. Thank you. Um, so kind of want to talk about employees um, and retention, running a business, very important, obviously, because without employees, you really can't grow. Tony, how do you, uh, what, strategy do, what strategies do you recommend for securing cannabis facilities, ensuring employee safety? Oh, I think that goes a lot with the retention, the, the, not only the safety, but the employees feel on that they're safe. You take most cannabis facilities, which is not unlike retail, it's 100% turnover. You know, there, there are uh, locations that do a good job and they stay. The majority of the time, that turnover is that the employee doesn't feel that they're valued, that anyone really cares enough about them, so they might as well go somewhere else. It's not even sometimes even about the money. It's, you know, feeling that part of the family, feeling, feeling wanted, feeling, you know, value from the retention you know, and, and can retaining those people. So we do a lot of uh, uh, online training. We do in, in-person training. We do robbery awareness, cash management. We have something called culture of honesty. You know, uh, again, um, I've been in retail for 25 years. The one thing I've learned in retail and one thing that holds true in cannabis is friends steal, family members steal even more. And you go under that <laughs> analogy it kind of works pretty well when it comes to the cannabis industry because it's again, it's the same thing. Uh, a grower takes a couple of buds, no one's going to notice. The biggest loss in a grow facility, you would be amazed. You would say people breaking in. It's not. It's the trim room. It's where they trim the buds to make them pretty. Is the biggest loss in cannabis, and not the people breaking in. Same thing with retail. Friends coming in, discounts. You know. Uh, we're the security, we were the security consultant for cookies and, and, and which is a large nationwide company. And they, you know, that was their biggest, biggest issue that they had there. I mean, how do you, how do you address that? How do you retain good employees, keep them honest, keep them engaged and make them incentivized to grow with you? You know, I, I think you have to set that example. You don't walk in without your mask on, you know, you gotta have <laughs> no, but seriously, you, you know, you can't be the owner and taking money out of the register because you're sending a message to people. And but again, what I'm not what I'm saying isn't really you don't have to connect it to canvas. It's it's retail 101. You know, a lot of people stay because they like staying. Why why do customers come back to the cannabis industry? Let's talk about the retail end of it. Do they come back because they like the 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 store? Do they like the product? Do they like the pricing? Maybe some of that has a component, but they like coming back because they like dealing with Mary. And Mary's been my, my bud tender. And I go see Mary and I tell her my foot hurts. And Mary gives me something that works. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go see Mary. And, and, and it's the same thing goes with the retention of that employee. That employee feels wanted. They stay. If they don't, they leave. It's, it's, it's very easy. It's black and white. There's no gray. It's black and white. You don't make your employees feel comfortable in any retail environment. They leave or they steal. The supplement, you know, and, and we, we have those too. And Hans, how about you? I met some of your lovely employees outside. Um, you know, how do you keep them engaged? Uh, you have a franchise opportunity or any of them interested in, uh, you know, moving into that sector after working with you? How do you keep everybody motivated? Uh, well, first, hire slow, fire fast, <laughs> right? So um, building a team is extremely difficult. Yeah. It's, it's extremely difficult. I'm, I'm, grateful for the team members that have been around for three years, five years, 10 years. You'll never feel like that's like a 1% of a 1% you find those people, right? So I'm uber grateful. Then to mentor them, teach them so that they can build teams, right? Because I need to get out of their way. Um, and so, the, and then another part of it is that nobody wants to work at a place that sucks, that pays them and treats them like shit. Like that's it. That's it. It's, and it's pretty simple, right? Like, I mean, just, and, and in, in a time where, you know, 
things are more expensive. We talk about livable wages, Austin getting more expensive. How do you keep your, your staff, right? And you have to make an effort to, to create an environment that, that makes them feel comfortable, safe, a place that they want to work, um, treat them well, pay them as, as, as much as you possibly can for their, the, the value they bring. Also, you have to address their value. And without your front end staff, they're the front line. They talk to the customers. Without them, guess who's back at the register? And, and I, you know, and that doesn't work, right? So um, I think training them well and uh, taking your time to hire the right people, even if, even if I have to work the register for another three, four weeks, six months until I find the right person, I think that's better than dealing with six bad people. Again, that cost is 10 times, 100 times more, whether it be your time, money, energy, product, stealing, anything. So all those things is, yeah, yeah definitely uh, take your time to hire your team and, and treat them well and appreciate them and, and they'll stick around. And the franchise opportunity, is there is that something that the employees can aspire to? Is that realistic? Or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that it has with training. I mean, <clears throat> they they might come into our, our company not really knowing what to expect. I mean, also we're in Texas, right? So you you're 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 training bud tenders, right? Where they're like, a bud tender doesn't exist here, but it does, right? So um we have it's a it's a hybrid of a barista and a bud tender. And uh, we want to train them to be able to manage a store, understand business 101, cost of goods sold, um, how to communicate properly with vendors. And if they are interested and, and we want them all to, of course, we, we want them all to aspire. You know, um, some are great leaders. Some are, you know, aspire to be business owners. And uh, you need to kind of you need to identify that who could be the best candidates and um being able to promote from within. And if we can get some of our stars to own stores, absolutely. That would be the best way to build. Yeah. Uh, so Tony, you have a lot of clients all over the country. How do you uh, keep training and supporting those clients, making sure they're aware of the, the latest and greatest? Uh, how do you, how do you spread yourself so uh, wide across the country and making sure all those clients are keeping, you know, updated with all of the security measures that you need to make sure that they have? You know, it's a challenge, you know, uh, being in the middle of the country helps because um, two days ago I was in New Jersey, four days ago I was in Baltimore. So just kind of give you an idea of the of the travel that we have that's involved. Uh, what's interesting, though, is when we communicate to our clients, a lot of them are opening up several stores or or moving forward or want to understand how they, they're going to be able to grow or be even be more profitable. We have a you have a different way of speaking to the client in Oregon than you do to speak to the client in New Jersey. It's just a different, different and I have to shift gears because you know I'm always in Jersey mode and I need to shift back and I'm talking to Colorado or I'm talking to Michigan or something like that. Um, a lot of times we'll get the inquiries and questions because we stay with our clients. You know, I've had clients that we've been their security director, basically fractional security. For uh, six years already, you know, a uh, uh, grow facility in Massachusetts. We've been with them for over six years, and we've helped them. So a lot of the communication will will get back to them either via email or text. But a lot of times we'll just get a call, and 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 sometimes the calls are even not security related. You know, um, you know we're you know what do you think of this? Let me bounce this up because we feel like we're we're part of that and. Going back to that retention question, we want them to feel that there's a team that's going on here. So, I mean, just for the benefit of the audience, some people don't know about applying for a, 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 an application, a cannabis application in a state. So describe to us, so you, some of them, you're just an on application, and then if the client's successful, you continue and you do the build out and you continue that relationship for a long Correct. time, or, or how does it work? So typically? we have three phases that we have in the cannabis industry. We we do other businesses. We do high risk, so jewelry, palm, liquor stores, trading card uh, business. But in the cannabis industry, we have three phases. And phase one is we'll help them with their application process. So in Texas, we did twelve applications in April of a year ago uh, in cannabis that we're waiting. We did eleven in Florida. We're waiting. Uh, so let's say the client applies, we help them with their application, we write the security section of the application. Um, 
they now are ready to build out. We'll help them with their, uh, with their city council presentation. You'll have to go in front of our planning board in your town, or we'll talk to the chief of police. Uh, I'm doing, we did, uh, I did over a hundred city council presentations last year alone, uh, just, you know, presenting uh, the, the design, the floor plan. I'm doing uh, two in New Jersey in, in, in a following next week. We'll design it. That's what I'm saying. That if you want to take a look at it, the video, the alarms, access control, that's phase two. We'll get an, we'll get it integrated. It'll come in the proposal. Now, phase three is where uh, it, it, the value of us come into play is we'll stay on board. If you're opening up one store. You really cannot afford a director of HR and director of security, even an IT, you know, in-house. So you're, it's you, you know, just like a jewelry, just like a pawn shop. It, it really is you. And the way the industry runs, it's you open up one, you manage it a certain way. You open up three, you manage it a certain way. You open up five, you manage it a certain way. You open up 15, 25, 50, and then you're off to the races once you get to 50. So it's not one, two, three, four, five. It's one, three, five, 15, 25, and 50. And, uh, and, e and in each of those sections, there's certain needs. When it comes to security, we call it the four to 24 store chain. We focus a lot on the mom pause, which is the one store chain, but we do a lot of work with the store that's four stores. Eventually, Hans is going to say, I can't put my arms around everything. I have, we'll say you have 20 stores. After a while, you need to hire that back support. And usually uh, when you get to 25, you're starting to really bring in a team and do that. How, did, how does it affect like an M&A scenario, mergers and acquisitions, if somebody acquires like a lot of licenses? How do, do you keep that relationship and keep doing security? On occasions we have, a, on a lot, you know, unless they're, they're purchased by a larger company. I said, you know, I told you that we started with Cookies. Cookies was at store eight when, when we started. They're at store 60 right now. They got to 25. We helped them hire an in-house in security director. GTI, Green Thumb, they, the, is Rise, I think, in this area. Um, uh, we started with them at store 14. They're in like store 60. True Leaf is at store 100 or something like that. So after a while, it gets to that point where you, you actually bring somebody in it. In that. Yeah. I mean, how do you stay competitive? You're one of the major, if not the the, the, the most uh, well-known security, cannabis security company. How do you stay so competitive in this area? You know, the, the one thing that we do, we're the only national security company. So there are a lot of security installers. The person who installed these cameras is a company, but the, all they do is that, I told you the three phases, application, build outs, and fractional security. They'll install the camera, then they're done. So almost 90% of the people you'll get involved in security is that individual who installs security equipment. We try and, we try and give them the whole, we call it application uh, to, to operations, and we stay with them at that point. And that's where we become valuable to a lot of people on non-security events. Um, uh, we just did it. So the last state said, are really moving is Minnesota, Minnesota, Kentucky, and Delaware. Uh, and that's in the last month. Um, there were a lot of clients that came to us in Minnesota that didn't even need us for security to begin with. They had so many other questions, architect, GC, you know, uh, application. So that's kind of where, you know, the secret sauce. And the other thing that's nice is that 90% of the security people, they're our client, they're our vendor. I don't play in their pawn. So... I never really go have a competition when it comes to that because I'm hiring ADT or Securitas or any of the other major security companies. Okay. Um, if we could shift Hans to product development, this is a, you know, obvious question. So I'm going to ask, ask you, how do you source your cannabis products? How do you decide which cannabis products to sell? Do you do research before to uh, ask your customers kind of what they're looking at? How do you decide this whole process and how do you source everything? Well, uh, r and is the funnest part, right? So, um, so, uh, we test the drugs. Uh, <laughs> no, well, well, uh, I mean, I'm a consumer. Um, so, and we are also a restaurant, right? So you are ingesting product. So one first thing is first is I don't want to get you sick. Right. Um, so we'll start there. Um, when it comes to cannabis products, you know, um, having been a consumer for 25 plus years, 13 or 14 years old or something, but I, I truly, you know, 
appreciate cannabis for what it is in its purest form, whether it be flour, concentrate, extract. Um, our team and myself, we try these products. We spend not only days, but sometimes months, even a year before we even bring in a product on our shelves. Some, you know, one of one of our rules, if I see it at a gas station, it's never getting on our shelves ever, you know, um, and that's kind of, un, you know, it may be unfortunate for some brands, but if that's the market that they want, then I'm not going to tell them how to make their money. But when we're operating in a state like New Mexico, you're required to purchase your product from in-state suppliers and farmers well that's how we support our local community by buying craft cannabis from the local farmers and we've got some weed snobs on our team and they want to make sure that we are offering the best quality cannabis because that's also going to bring a returning customer um if we won't smoke it why would we sell it if we wouldn't need it why would we make you eat it if it tastes like shit then why would i want you to try it right so and then we spend months developing these relationships with the vendors, um, you have to, there has to be a whole line of, you know, planets align. You know, it's not just about price. I mean, I can find cheap weed, but just because the margin's great doesn't mean we're going to bring it on our shelves. Um, making sure they have obviously the lab reports and they're legitimate. Um, you know, does the, does it work? Like if I'm going to buy a vaporizer, is it going to break? Is it going to blow up in my pocket? Is it going to clog? Um, is it, um, is it a Franken blend of cannabinoids that I don't know these alphabet words? If I can't explain it, I probably shouldn't be selling it. Um, if, you know, if, if the price is wrong, the packaging is ugly. If it looks like it's supposed to be marketed to children, there's a lot of factors that go into whether it ends up on our shelves. Um, when it comes to product development, I've also been involved in, uh, Developing a patented product. Has anyone seen the student glass gravity bong, the one that Seth Rogen does and it spins around? And well, we helped develop that. You know, a friend of mine, he worked at Apple and he came up to me with that thing strapped to his chest at a South by Southwest thing. And he goes, check this out. And I go, I know bongs and that, that thing is badass. So we helped develop it. We got it from idea, from a prototype. Luckily, it got into Seth Rogen's hands. It went viral and then we were forced to put it into production. Um, and that's just a unit. You know, that's just a you know, it's a physical product. That wasn't something that you ingest. Um, you know, we look at, you know, wanting to develop um, like beverages, you know, our own canned beverages or things that are white labeled under our brand. Uh, you know, we start with small things, you know, merchandise, ashtrays, grinders. I mean, there's not a lot of product development in that. But when it comes to the cannabis products, what it takes to get on our shelves, uh, you know, there's a criteria, there's a checklist and, and, you know, we're, we're very thorough and, uh, you know, if you're going to be putting it in your lungs or in your stomach, we want to make sure it's safe. So when, you know, I was involved in the, the CBD space where we were creating companies with Dr. Z and, you know, you go through this whole product development aspect and you think, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. Everyone's going to love it. And then you're like, oops. Uh, so for you, what products did really well, which one are your best sellers and why, and where did you make a mistake in terms of I should never have made that product and why? I got to think of like, where did I really mess up? Right. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Um, um, or your bestseller too. Well, okay. So a bestseller, I, I'll, I'll, a good example is the Chaga Chino, the, the drink we had outside. Right. Um, that was approached to us by a rep, total cold call showed up. And it hit all of the marks. It One, it tasted good. The packaging was good. The marketing, the branding was good. It was on point. Um, it was effective. It mixed well. Uh, the baristas and the bud tenders were excited about it. Uh, the brand provided support. You know, these are, that was something that worked, right? Uh, then, I don't know. I think, I think it was like a bad purchase at like one of these conventions. And I was like, yeah, why don't we spend about five grand on that stuff? And three years later, it was half of it was still sitting there. And then you're like, and, and that as a retailer, you need to learn when to take a loss or when to clearance something. Right. And you will go to some retailers and they will have the oldest product on the shelf just because they do not want to take a loss. 
man, that is cash flow sitting there on the shelf and you got bills to pay. You better get rid of that like ASAP. Do something with it. Throw it in the trash. Call it a loss. Do something, but don't let it sit there and then try and pass it off to your to your customers. Um, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like, uh, there's a lot of fuck ups, but I'll, just, <laughs> I'll say that some bad purchasing, overspending on, on, you know, yeah, on inventory, try it out first, get some samples, actually get data, get feedback from your customers before making the investment that can, it can bite you back. So just to kind of, we were talking about this marketing and branding, um, what efforts do you make in marketing? How much of your budget do you spend on marketing and branding? Uh, how important is it to keep your business afloat? So I love marketing. I love it. It's so cool to psychologically get people to do things because you presented a thing and they and you and it caused a reaction or an action. That's awesome. So because you put it at eye level because you changed the color scheme because you made the font more uh, legible or you created a marketing campaign that was effective, that had immediate impact. And then you were able to track it because you had metrics. So um, how important is marketing? Very important. It's so important that if you're going to start marketing, it essentially means you can never stop marketing because once you start, and if you do a start and stop approach, that's actually negatively affecting you. So when Beginning to do marketing, you you need to go, all right, I do zero marketing here, but I'm going to start. So I'm going to just do this straight line, consistent marketing. Then once you have consistent marketing, then you can start doing gimmicks and then you have these little pops, right? So uh, marketing is super important. How much do we spend on marketing? Well, I'd like to spend a lot more, but marketing costs money, right? Then we also have a lot of restrictions within cannabis. So then you've got... Let's say you've got an unlimited budget and you've got limited options and someone like Weed Maps wants you to spend all your money to be listed on a directory. So, sorry, Weed Maps, I'm going to shit on you. But why would I spend my money on Weed Maps to be listed on a directory with all my direct competition on there? That doesn't make any sense. Why would I pay Yelp? to offer me features when it's free on Google. So knowing, knowing how organic marketing works. So first thing, like you got to build fundamental, you got to build a foundation, right? So start with some SEO, make sure that your website is fully built SEO so people can find you. Can they find you? I just need to pick up my phone and be like, where can I find this dispensary near me? And like, you need to be able to be found. Um, then with all the limitations of marketing for cannabis, you can't use Google AdWords. You'll get banned on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn is starting to kind of limit a little bit. You've got Twitter, you've got, so then that's just social, right? But how else do you market? So you've got other opportunities to market. You can go out in the wild, you can do events, but you can't be everywhere. And events also cost money. So here's my, here's my advice. These are my suggestions, right? One is make sure that your foundation is built SEO. If you're a dispensary near me, cannabis lounge near me, whatever it might be, make sure people can find you. Make sure you have a good Google listing. Do some YouTube videos. If you use more Google products, guess what? Google likes you more. So they'll find you more. Um, to be found on an Apple product, you got to be on Yelp. Um, now, then after that, here's the two things that work. Email marketing and text message marketing. But you got to be careful, right? Because you can get flagged. Email marketing has the highest return of all marketing. End of story. I mean, it costs you pennies, less than pennies to send out an email and you have immediate impact. You can track it. There's metrics. You know who opened it, when they opened it, on what phone they opened it. Did they click on it? There was a call to action on it. Did it go to the, did it go to the site? And then your Google Analytics will tell you, did they convert? Ultimately, you're trying to get them within the funnel, keep them in the funnel, and at the end, make a sale and, so, and complete the transaction. The next part is um, SMS, text messages. Everybody has a phone here. They may not look at that email, but they are looking at that text message. And if I tell them happy birthday, come in for 10% off, they might show up the same day. You don't have to wait. And you can also find that there are also metrics attached to it. You know, did they open it? What phone did they open it from? How many people did you, how many people did you actually send that to? So 
The other part of marketing is data, right? You got to like, you got to gather data. You got to get everybody's phone number, everybody's email. Once you have all that, then you got to go, well, what am I going to do with this data? Well, I got to market to them. And the, and the, the end goal of marketing is sales, right? So uh, marketing is very important. I think you should build on fundamentals, uh, build a foundation. Even if you're not doing tons of social, um, at least do it consistently. You don't have to be like, because social can take all your day. You can take a whole day to do a reel and get five likes. It's like fucking discouraging, you know? And, and, and not only that, you paid a firm to do it and they got 10 more right behind it. And you're like, this cost how much? Right. So you start to break down. There's content creation. There's the graphic design. There's the, um, you know, the, the wording that goes along with it, right? I mean, is it, is it actionable? Is it interactive? Is it engaging? Is it, is it just to throw shit at the wall and hope it sticks? No, the end goal is called action and conversion, right? So marketing is very important. And yeah, that's it. Jeff. That's, those are the hacks. Um, yeah, I mean, you can spend a lot of money, but if you're not doing those things first, why spend any money? I mean, like, you know, because you're just going to waste it with weed maps or Google AdWords get shut down. Facebook used to be awesome, but you can't even get an ad through it anymore. So yeah, start with email and text. And uh, if you're going to do text, don't say pre-roll or joint. Just say like broccoli or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I mean, your perspective of marketing is obviously B2C. So that's a different way to market to people. Now, Tony, you're B2B. I think you do a very effective job of marketing on LinkedIn. I always notice your posts. Uh, I know all the other businesses. So so what is your secret to marketing as a, as a B2B? I think, uh, you know, one of the things is content creation and how to communicate to other businesses. How, how many people here have LinkedIn? Raise your hand. How many people have um more than 1,000 contacts on LinkedIn. How many have 5,000 contacts on LinkedIn? How many have 10, 15, 20? I have 31,000 on LinkedIn. 31,000 people I do not know. <laughs> but if you constantly are producing content, you know, 5,000 contacts on Facebook, you know, and, and this is not, this is just company and ours. We find that we do a lot of communication. You know, it's interesting. The people who are interested in what we do follow a lot of, like, I'm at the Texas Policy Convention today, and I'm meeting all these people, and that's the likes I get more so, or my sneakers. They like my sneakers, and they take pictures of my sneakers in the airport. They like more so than we have a robbery awareness training program, or we can save you money on you. So what I find from uh, uh, our 20% our of our business is focused on sales development, branding, leads, and so forth. I find that a lot of people, like I, we've been saying about retail, use us because they feel they know us a little more. You know, my, my dad was a New York City fireman in Manhattan, and I posted the 9-11 and, you know, and people see that and they respond to that type of thing. So that's, that's, what our, our, that's how we do B2B. That marketing uh, piece for B2B, um, how much of it is explaining to your clients uh, helping with their security breaches? I mean, how much money are you saving them? Are you able to articulate that so that I'm going to go with Sapphire because if I have a breach, which most of your clients, I'm sure, have a breach at some point. How do you mitigate that and help, how do you help them with that? So we call that fear tactics. There's a fear approach. You know, uh, if you watch TV, sometimes you might see a politician who's talking about fear or, or you're talking about or someone's got a product that they're trying to sell. Uh, one of our, our, our uh, B2B customers is a customer that produces a device that if you the device leaves the store, you can track it. So you would put it in some cannabis or you would put it, you know, it's a device, a tracking device, but they market it. And if you're ever robbed, if you're ever broken into, if you ever have a fire, if someone's had a heart attack, it's kind of that fear tactic. And what we find is, although we do sometimes talk about that, a lot of our clients come to us because they want to be proactive. Uh, and, and, you know, I can say this because I grew up in New York, New Jersey. There are a lot of arrogant business people 
in the world who feel they know everything until they don't know it anymore. But there's a lot of also a lot of good business people who say, I'm going to get in front of that. You know, I'm going to understand I'm going to order order 200 pre-rolls and not 500 pre-rolls because Snoop Dogg's coming tomorrow, you know, or something of that nature. Um, so for both of you guys, partnerships and collaborations with other businesses, people, um, how important is that? And, and what are you looking for? I mean, is the platform, if you're looking for a specific partner to do something, um, how do you, how do you partner with different companies or individuals? Um, well, I mean, partnerships can be complicated, right? Um, but, uh, I actually, you know, embrace partnerships now, uh, you know, when you find the right partner, you can build something twice as fast. Uh, you find the wrong partner, you can fail twice as fast. But uh, I mean, I, I look for uh, integrity, I, I believe, you know, um, something that I, I just wanted to add this all like you're talking a few times. But like one of the reasons I work with Sapphire is that and like and we talk about branding is that you got to build your, your your brand needs to gain the trust of your customer. So we've worked together. Sapphire has gained the trust of our company to continue to work with you guys. And I think that's something you guys have also built within your brand. Why, why are they, why don't they have any competition? Well, he's found a niche in security. He doesn't, that he doesn't have to fight with ADT. He doesn't have to do the install. It's like the super duper plumber, like the super Mario brothers who are just into plumbing. They're like, but I'm just going to do weed plumbing now, you know? And that makes sense because now people trust the super Mario brothers. So I think you built a great brand around Sapphire. You built trust and your clients come back to you and they see that. That's why we come back to you. You found a great niche and you know, I think that works, you know? And uh, so I, I wanted to add that. I got to give him $20 now for that. <laughs> and I like to think of me like Donkey Kong. Yeah. The yeah. 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 Thank you for mentioning your shoes. I didn't even notice. Yeah, that. I don't know if you saw this guy's shoes, but they are. Shoes are my shoes in the airport. That's so cool. I probably have had, I don't know, hundreds, but I mean, they don't take pictures of me, though. Just my shoes. So <laughs> with the shoes. <laughs> And for so, $80, the Chinese will make anything. So uh, <laughs> I just wanted to ask one last question and then open it up for audience participation. And, and this is the kind of what I wanted to end on with both of you guys is what are your future plans for expansion? Where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you want to be in five years? Um, so we've been doing this 11 years. So, you know, our expansion is to continue to support the cannabis industry as it grows. 11 years ago, this industry was extremely different. I was at this show three or four years ago. It was extremely different. You know, Texas is Colorado 10 years ago or 15 years ago, getting there. You know, Nebraska is with Texas. So it, it's fun to be in a state that is growing and maturing you know, I'm going to see everyone here, uh, God help, in 10 years from now, and there'll be 12 of these that'll be dispensary owners, and two years will be manufacturing, and one will be doing delivery, and we'll all sit here and go, you remember when we were in Texas, and, you know, there was nothing there, it was lazy days, and that was it, you know, <laughs> and now he's, you know, he's retired on his yacht, and he's having a good time there. So I think that Sapphire is going to continue to grow. I think as the industry grows, we continue to grow with it. We do other things, like I said, you know, jewelry stores, pawn shop, liquor, convenience stores, other high risk businesses. Um, and that's where I, I actually see, I see us more being more of a footprint. We have, we have people in, uh, on boots on the ground, I call it in, in Colorado. We have them in New Jersey. We have them in Texas. So just adding more of that physical support there. Um, all right. So, um, what does the future hold for us, uh, or, and me personally? So I'm an entrepreneur at heart, uh, you know, and I think in an entrepreneur's journey, whatever business you decide to go in, I think you should also learn to plan in reverse plan backwards. Right. So you want to start a business and you're like, I really want to do this thing, but you need to ask yourself, do I want to be doing that same thing in five years? Am I still going to be hyped up about it 10 years from now? What about 20 years? Okay. So we've reached 20 years. That's where I'm at. 
Okay, so what does the future hold for Lazy Days? Well, we are a franchise model. I would love to see Lazy Days hit its hundred store, you know, in the next three to five years, whether it's a hundred stores sold, 30 stores open, operating. I'd, I'd love to see Lazy Days as a as a household brand name being known for coffee and weed. End of story. Very simple. If you want to go get a coffee and a joint, you know, you go down to the local Lazy Days. Um, from a macro standpoint, I'm, I'm, I've evolved too. I'm, I'm no longer a smoke shop owner. I'm no longer just a barista and a bud tender or a coffee shop owner. I've evolved and, and luckily, you know, been able to become the CEO of a publicly traded company. And so, you know, what does that mean? What, what does that even mean? What do you do? Right? Well, I mean, as an entrepreneur, then I've had to think of an exit. You know, when, when is it time to exit? When is it time to, you know, to, to, to uh, say I've, I've worked long enough and it's time to, you know, to reap the reward because it's a lot of work to get there. So what does the future hold? I mean, I think I'd like to see Lazy Days hit its hundred store. I'd like our company to have built a valuation that makes us a acquisition target um, for somebody much larger, right? And taking the company public also gives us opportunity to, you know, dabble in M&A and mergers and acquisitions. Do, do we look at other companies who may want to acquire and merge and, and build our brand bigger, build a portfolio of brands? Um, you know, that's from kind of a high level, right, where, where I'd like to see it go. Then, you know, I think Lazy Days is just an awesome brand. I mean, the mushrooms and the, and the hammock, it, it just resonates with a lot of people. I think with, without even saying the word Lazy Days, you just see the logo in it and it just kind of resonates with it. So I'd like to see the brand continue to grow. I'd like to see the stores continue to grow. I'd like to see the franchise model be very successful. I'd like to build our public company um, and, uh, you know, add some other assets to it. And uh, then, uh, probably go hang out on the beach with Tony on a yacht somewhere and, you know, but three to five years, I think uh, I'd like to start entertaining exit and see what that looks like, what a liquidity event would look like. Um, and, you know, with catalysts, you know, on the horizon. And, and I think the inevi inevitability of legalization will change our lives dramatically, everybody in here, right? Um, this is something that affects my livelihood. You know, if, if we were to go legal, it would change my life and my, my family's life and everybody else's lives in here. So, um, yeah. And, uh, just to continue to innovate, build our company, build strong, build it on fundamentals and keep kicking ass. And the ticker symbol for what is the ticker symbol? Oh, so yeah. So MedX holdings, it is uh trade on OTC. The ticker symbol is med H. So that's kind of cool. You guys can actually invest in our company. And, uh, if you guys are interested in doing something larger, you know, with our company or definitely, you know, love to listen and talk with you guys. Right. Thank you. Um, so open it up for audience questions. Just a couple, if we have time, does anybody have any questions for either one of these guys? Y'all want to learn some front Go ahead. LinkedIn, right? Go ahead. So there's a, so there's AI technology now that we, you know, the camera system can look in a grow room, depending on, you know, the biggest greenhouse we ever did was 450,000 square feet. And uh, in, in Vegas and uh, uh, Nevada, we grew, we put 105,000 plants in the ground. Put so many plants in the ground that under federal law, it was considered a drug cartel. The location. Um, when you get to these mega grows or even a small grow, having that AI technology that can identify if the humidity is too high, if the if the if the plant is showing signs that it needs to be watered. What kind of insects, if there's insects that, that are that are that are involved or anything of that nature? You know, a lot of times, a lot of growth facilities. We well, we we've opened 160 locations. We probably have done about 60 grows. There's some grows, you know, grow 101. Like you know, uh, oh, it's a, it was a flower facility, uh, so we'll just turn it into a cannabis facility. Well, that's the, the kiss of death because there's bugs from the flower facility or insecticides or something of that nature. So the, the technology can identify that, those kind of things. If a plant's in the rest, uh, the AI technology is able to identify that. Yeah, if, uh, 
if you want to send me your email, I'll I'll I'll, I'll get you that information. You want all day, all day, every day. Yeah, it's, it's a nonstop. Yeah, um, I've I can't even count the amount of uh, banks have shut me down. I can't even count the amount of uh, credit card processors I've been shut down. I'm actually very special. I'm on a list called the blacklist. <laughs> okay, and um, so I'm act. It's I have a question. And will I ever be released from the blacklist when this goes legal? Right? I don't even know that. Like, I, honestly, like I, I'm on this list that is like like a super special that you can't get off of, right? And so, yeah, actually, it, it is. It's still um, having access to capital is still a, a big deal. That's one of the reasons we decided to take our company public, right? Uh, raising capital from private investors and make in, in is is different from being able to raise money in the public market, right? Um, and they both have their pros and cons. Uh, you know, where where can an aspiring cannabis company go to find money, right? And you start with friends and family. Bank's probably not going to touch you. Um, so does it come from private angels? Um, SBA won't touch you. So you, you, it's a special kind of investor, right? And uh, and and it can deplete your personal funds and savings very quickly if you're not prepared. So you know about 2ADE, I imagine, right? that story. Does everyone know the history of 2ADE? Does anyone know not know what 2ADE is? Okay. 2ADE, do you want me to? I'll tell the story. I have the microphone, so I'll tell the story. <laughs> 2ADE is a uh, federal tax law that says that you cannot profit from an illegal activity. came about in the 80s because there was a guy that was dealing in cocaine. He would file his taxes. He would claim the cocaine. He would claim the transportation of the cocaine. He would claim the hitman that had to kill people for the cocaine and all that. Legally, back then, he did not do anything wrong under the tax law. He was running a business and he was claiming the tax uh, 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 deductions. Federal government said, hey, this doesn't seem right. So they formed something called 280E. 280E says that you cannot take a deduction for an illegal activity. Cannabis federally is an illegal activity. Makes it very difficult for you to take this deduction. Makes it very difficult for you to take the, the uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, profit as a normal company would because you can't take a lot of deductions. Um, some of them can, but most of them you can't. When it comes to the banks, you know, it's interesting. 11 years ago, banking was horrible, horrible. Now it's bad, but there are banks you can go to, Valley Bank, so forth. Interesting thing is like, you can't bank in the, I was in the pawn shop industry for, uh, and you can't bank at Wells Fargo in the pawn shop industry. You can't bank at Bank of America and Chase and all of these other, but there are niches that you can, once you start to understand you can do a regional bank, you know, and Co-America is a good bank, this, for, you know, or something of that nature. Same thing with insurance, same issues with insurance. The big insurance companies won't insure you. But, you know, until 280E goes away, um, the industry is going to be hampered by it. Yeah, I mean, there's a, um, in New Mexico, our, we use a federal credit union. They charge us $500 a month just to have an account. I mean, just to have an account. I mean, and then I'm like, what, what are you guys doing for me? And it's, it's, and, and, and then they ask for regulatory, you know, compliance paperwork monthly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of barriers there. Okay. Uh, you've done such an amazing job building this iconic brand. And I, I don't know how many people have streamed it, but basically it's sort of gone. But I know we've all heard of it because what you've been doing is a hard work for the how do you yeah, protect your brand from new people, new new entities coming into the market and trying to rip off your idea, right? Or rip off your branding and your vibe? What do you do about that? Because I'm going to be seeing a lot of I love the biters. Uh, <laughs> well, um, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Uh, you, as a matter of fact, don't do anything. Mind your business. I could I could care less, honestly. Um, I am so focused on what we do. Um, welcome to my space. I dare you 
And, and it's not like, and it's not hockey whatsoever. It's, it's more like I've got a team. I've been around for 20 years. Um, Hey, newcomer, call me when you pay your taxes. You know, like I'm not worried about them one bit. Um, one thing that I know that is, uh, is, is true to us is we're authentic. I was, I was on acid watching Metallica Woodstock 99. <laughs> I don't know what y'all are doing, but like, I mean, I come from it. I live it. I breathe it. I'm a musician. I'm an artist. I love counterculture. It runs through my blood, through my team's blood. That's a big differentiator for us. So I'm not really, I mean, hey, I mean, we're, if, if we're setting the standard, great. Awesome. If you're going to try and come up with an idea that's similar, cool. Uh, you know what? Please, by all means, go spend more money and, you know, go burn it and learn or, or call me and I could help you out. You know, I, I'm, I've, I, they're not my enemies. They're, hey, competition breeds innovation. I mean, you're only going to make me better. Um, I, 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 say, I, I wake up at 5 a.m. because um, I'm trying to be awake before my competition. You know, that's, that's basically how it is. Like, uh, California is still asleep 3 a.m. You know, I'm, I'm worried about the guy in New York if he's waking up earlier than me. Um, uh, I think if you're in business, just focus, don't worry about the competition. They're going to be there regardless and nine out of 10 fail anyways. So I'll see you at the top. You know, I think what he's saying is valuable. Don't worry about the competition. Before I remember, I mentioned to you that there's a lot of arrogant people. Well, I'm one of those arrogant people out there. In our office, we have the board, we have the wall of the dead, we call it. Seriously, you can't make this up. And on that is business cards over the last 11 years of people who have come into this industry and realized that they can't make a go of this industry and have left this industry. And I love it because you watch them and they throw so much money so fast. You know, my people panic always. They're like, oh, look at this guy. He just dropped $100,000 at a trade show. And you're like, I know, but wait. Why? Yeah. Why would you do that? I know, but yeah. wait. And, you know, and, and, but uh, again, you, you know, not worrying about what they do and you doing your job, I think is very important. And, and you know, there'll be that flash that'll come up. There'll be, you know, we will go into a, a, a city and there'll be five cannabis stores in one city. And they're like, oh, well, how, we're not going to make money. I know, but do what, do your job and there'll be two. <laughs> in the next three years and those others will leave. Great. Well, thank you. That was a great way to end it. We're out of time guys. So we can't take any more questions. Um, so if we can give a round of applause to Tony and Hans, thank you guys so much. I really like staying there. Well, thank you for coming here. Um, just a quick announcement, 10 o'clock tomorrow, we uh, resume uh, conference activities. And right now there's a VIP uh, speaker happy hour around the corner at the room number is 23 E. 2300 E. So right around the corner. All right. Thank you. And if anyone wants to take a photo, you're more than welcome to yes. of the floor plan.